All rise. Court of Appeals, Division One, is now in session. You may be seated. Good morning. We are here this morning on our case number 1CACV170665, Harl versus Williams. Uh, counsel, as you know, we size a lot of 20 minutes for your argument. The appellate may reserve any amount of time you'd like to use in rebuttal. If you do decide to reserve time, though, you're in, in charge of keeping track of it for yourself. The clock on the podium will reflect the total amount you have remaining, including what you might have decided to reserve. We have uh, studied the briefs and the record in the case. We've also discussed the case in our conference this morning. So with that, you can proceed. Oh, you know what? I forgot to mention, when you approach the podium, if you'd give us your name and the name of your client, because we're, we're trying to record these proceedings. I understand with lesser effectiveness today than normally, but not because of the bailout, because of the recording system. <laughs> but try it out anyway. Your Honor, uh, may it please the court, I'm Andy Harnish from May Potenza, Barron and Gillespie, and I represent the appellant, uh, Mark Williams. The question that's presented to you in this case today is the following. When the Arizona legislature says that judgments expire after five years, unless timely renewed, is that what they meant? Or should that bright line rule that was announced by the legislature be blurred by a progression of exceptions and departures that are decided on a case-by-case -case basis solely to benefit particular judgment creditors who just couldn't be bothered to follow the straightforward rule that was announced by the lawmakers. But cancel, cancel. Isn't that a little unfair characterization? Because it's not that they didn't care, it's just that the, yeah, the judgment was not enforceable by agreement and doesn't the inability to sue or to enforce the judgment uh, extend that? So the facts in this case, Your Honor, are that um, while there was a settlement agreement that included a covenant not to execute, um, the parties agree that that agreement was uh, was violated. Uh, there was a default under that agreement about three and a half years into uh, the judgment renewal period. Okay, so at that point, by the terms of the agreement, um, the appellee had um, every opportunity and indeed the right to take any enforcement action it wanted, which would include filing the the renewal affidavit. Now, our position is that. Even if we were in compliance in year five, um, there wouldn't have been any prohibition on filing a renewal affidavit because the case law that we cited to you says it's filing that affidavit is a ministerial act. It's not an act to collect. So that's not something that was barred by the covenant not to execute. So on the fifth anniversary, your client could walk, uh, walk uh, away if the judgment kind of being Renewed? Yes. So our position, Your Honor, is that judgments in Arizona, at least at the time that that it's been amended, right, to extend that time period to ten to ten years. Um, during the time period at issue here, um, the the judgment, according to Arizona law, was good for five years unless renewed, and there was nothing prohibiting the judgment creditor here from renewing its judgment as required by the Arizona statute. There was nothing in the agreement that prohibited the creditor here from renewing its judgment as provided in the statute. So my answer to your question, Your Honor, is that even if we were in compliance with that agreement through year five, it was a 100-month agreement, so it extended past uh, five years, the Arizona statute imposed an obligation on the creditor to keep its judgment alive. Yeah. It, it, it just seems kind of unfair to be able to walk away from it. Well, but that's a balance that was struck 
Sure, that was a balance that was struck by the legislature, right? I mean, one might say that it's unfair to walk away from a debt after five years, period, if you owe the debt, right? That's one policy that could be articulated by the legislature. The policy that the legis legislature chose to articulate was that a judgment debt is going to survive for five years. It, notwithstanding what payments have been made, what execution the creditor has managed to uh, to uh, to execute. Um, it, so it's incumbent upon every judgment creditor in Arizona to keep its debt alive. And there's a simple and straightforward procedure for doing so, right? Does it change your your, your analysis if, if there had been um, no breach of the contract in, in the first five years, but the breach happened on in year six? Right. So, um, so our position, Your Honor, is that filing the renewal affidavit is a ministerial act. It's not an action to collect. It's not an action to enforce the judgment. Um, that comes out of the Smith case, the Arizona Supreme Court case in Smith. Um, and so um, our position is that um, it was incumbent upon this creditor to renew its judgment at five years, whether or not Mr. Williams was still in compliance with the settlement agreement. Now, that's, those aren't the facts that are presented to the right, court right. here. Right? So, so, so even if there, was, there had been, even if by contract uh, your adversary could not have uh, sought to collect on the judgment, uh, your position is he lost that opportunity when he failed to renew after five years. Right, and, and our position is indeed that every judgment creditor who doesn't protect their rights loses that right after five years. So what about the cases? What sure. about the cases that extend that that, that toll? Sure. So, um, so even though the statute is pretty clear, um, announces a very bright line rule, there have been um, a handful of cases in Arizona um, that have found um, that the renewal, uh, the, the beginning of the renewal deadline is told under a narrow set of circumstances. Um, and each of those cases presents essentially the same set of circumstances, um, which, is it, which is the following. Um, all of those cases, um, have two things in common that aren't present here. Number one, the judgment creditor in each of those cases was subject to an absolute prohibition on collection. Number two, that prohibition on collection was imposed on the judgment creditor by a court order, an injunction, a stay, or similar device with, with, uh, with a legal effect, right? In this case, oh, the when, uh, let me stop you for just a moment. When you say or similar device with a legal effect, wouldn't a contract fall under that category? No, because, Your Honor, uh, in this case, there was a voluntary repayment arrangement, right, which contained a covenant not to execute, but, as we point out, was also a form of controlled execution because, after all, the judgment creditor got paid $24,000 under this voluntary repayment arrangement that the, that the parties had negotiated, right? So, you know, the, the appellee's position here is that, um, you know, a, con a legally binding contract is good enough to um, fall within the exception that's articulated in the Chudzinski case and, North, and, and, um, and the other cases that are cited to the court. Um, but this arrangement is different from all of those cases in the sense that, number one, um, the prohibition on additional execution was part of a voluntary bargain that was entered into by both sides. It, I, I, I take your point, but why does that make any difference? The reason it makes a difference? You still you may have bound yourself, but you're just as bound as if, as if a court did it. Sure. Um, Your Honor, that's, that's the dispute here, right? That's, that's really the crux of the dispute. But here's why it's different. Um, the policy um, that is probably best articulated in the Harding versus Sutherland case, but it's a th common thread that runs through all these cases, Chudzinski, Groves versus Source, North Star Development, and Harding, um, is that 
there's something unfair about telling a judgment creditor you have five years to collect on your judgment and then also having a court tell that judgment creditor but you can't collect for the first two and a half years that you have this judgment right so that's a short changing effect that's imposed on the creditor from outside um, so all of those cases um, involve a court or for instance the automatic stay a federal statute all telling the creditor you may not collect period right so that's why this exception has been articulated that look that seems unfair so we're going to give that we're going to tax some extra time on the back of the five years so that you have your full five years to collect what's different about this case in this case the judgment creditor um, made an informed decision that he would rather accept a stream of voluntary payments which reduce the balance on the judgment by twenty four thousand dollars and the agreement also provided that the creditor got a waiver of a valuable valuable rights to a piece of real property um, and made the decision that in exchange for that voluntary set of payments on the judgment they were okay with agreeing not to garnish accounts impose liens on property and do those types of things that judgment debtors don't like to happen right so where all of the other cases that have been cited to you um, involve a fact pattern where an outside authority impose an absolute bar to collection on the judgment creditor in this case the judgment creditor chose to receive payments right so there was no absolute bar to collection um, and it was a voluntary repayment scheme that happened to involve um, a covenant not to enter into any further execution beyond what they were agreeing to accept so that's really that's really what distinguishes this case from all the other cases that have found tolling if the covenant not to execute had been contained in the judgment it'd be a different matter wouldn't it yes if the judgment had said and you may not take any actions to collect during the during a certain period of time as long as the debtor is in compliance we have a different scenario because then that that brings it more into the realm of um, like the Groves versus source case which is a case that that said that that arose out of a divorce but what the what the court told the parties was um, you know I'm entering a twelve thousand dollar judgment against wife but in the same judgment it says you can't collect on that judgment until one of three things happens you know the property sells wife defaults on the mortgage or five years have passed well that's the type of scenario where there's an absolute bar to collection of that judgment and so it makes sense to tack additional time onto the end but what if we still had this payment arrangement and the the settlement agreement was simply included in the judgment it was part and parcel of the judgment and an order of the court but we still have the payments unlike the case you just referenced I mean I think that that's a scenario that that hasn't been presented um, or I don't think that that ha that a rule has been articulated in that case well but according to your argument the distinction is that there's a court order that's yes. not present under the facts of this case so if the agreement had been subsumed into the judgment then you wouldn't have that and so what would be the legal effect sure so I have an answer for that um, which is um, it's the Chudzinski case uh, which is the again it's another divorce type proceeding and the order in that case provided for a stream of payments I think they were in the nature of child support payments right so in that case judge says um, wife you have a judgment um, and the judgment provides that husband shall make monthly child support payments over a period of time that exceeds the five years okay what the court in that case said was um, you can only sue for the last five years of payments um, before the the action on the judgment was brought so I think that um, the Chudzinski case says that in a situation where a judgment provides for a stream of payments that exceeds the five years 
and the party fails to renew the judgment after the five years, they have waived their right to receive any payments that are old, any defaulted payments that are older than the five years. But here, you, 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 you're distinguishing um, the contract here that was entered into, the settlement agreement by which the other side promised not to execute from an absolute bar on executing. What's the difference between a court? I mean, how, how is it matter? Why should it make a difference whether it's the court that's ordering the party not to execute or the party is agreeing in an enforceable contract not to execute? There, there, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of differences, Your Honor. Number one is the fairness aspect, where in a situation where the court is ordering that you cannot receive any payments on this judgment period, there's a fairness problem with then telling the judgment creditor, and you only have five years to collect, notwithstanding the fact that there's a period of time that you are legally barred from collection. The same fairness consideration is not present here, where the party voluntarily entered into a repayment scheme um, that was a matter of contract between two private parties. Well, it was a compromise. It was a compromise. And the party was given up a lot, presumably, we would say. And well, of course, it was a bargain that under which both parties got something they wanted and gave up something that they probably would rather not give up, right? But notably, what the agreement didn't say was, and by the way, you know, without knowing so and without saying anything in the document, you're also waiving an important protection that is granted to every judgment debtor in Arizona, which is by signing this settlement agreement, you are waiving the protection of this statute, Section 1551B, which says that there's an endpoint on your debt, judgment debtor. And so the point that we're trying to make here is that um, if you extend the exception to include private post-judgment settlement agreements, um, then you're injecting an enormous amount of uncertainty into what was originally intended to be a very straightforward rule, right? Because if you find that a post-judgment settlement agreement automatically tolls the start of the five-year period, you're essentially writing a new implied term into every post-judgment settlement agreement that contains a covenant not to execute, right? And that implied term is whether you intended to or not, judgment debtor, when you agreed to make payments in exchange for relief from garnishments and so forth, without knowing it, you also waive the protection of Section 1551, right? So in addition to radically altering the bargain struck by many, many parties, including agreements that are, pro that are enforced as we speak, right? There are all these agreements out there right now um, where what the appellee is saying is, you should read an implied term into all of those bargains that are in force right now. But isn't the other side of that argument then saying, and you, judgment creditor, this agreement is absolutely worthless unless you continue to uh, renew the judgment? It, yes, Your Honor, and, and we don't think that that's um, a draconian um, imposition on judgment creditors because judgment creditors should know that they're required to renew their judgments. We're not changing the rules one bit with respect to judgment creditors. Our position is you should find that Section 1551B applies to Mr. Harley just like it applies to all the other judgment creditors in Arizona. Let me ask you um, uh, another question. Um, can you address the In Ray Smith case in, in terms of uh, the difference between renewal and enforceability. Of sure. The, of the sure. What what uh, my understanding of what the Smith case says is that um, in an appropriate situation where the court can find that the five year limitation period is told, um, the judgment remains enforceable through and including the end point that includes the tolling period. So just factual example, and I'm going to try to reserve two minutes for rebuttal here. Um, but factual example is um, where there's a supersedious bond that prevents um, execution for a period of two years after the judgment is, is entered. Um, what 
the uh, the North Star case says is that's an appropriate scenario where we would toll the beginning of the five year period um, past the original five year expiration. So in effect, the judgment creditor would obtain a seven year um, uh, validity period on its judgment under the old version of the statute, right? In that scenario, what the Smith case says is. Um, while you may renew as provided in the statute, so within 90 days before the, the, the running of the five years, you may still execute through the seven year period and renew at any time between the five and seven year period. I think that's what the holding of the Smith case was, Your Honor. And I think I'd like to re reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal. Sure. May it please the court, my name is John Egbert. I represent the appellee, uh, Lynn Harley. Uh, I think to begin with, I'd like to make sure we correct the record with respect to what the agreement actually required here. Um, counsel indicates that if the breach of the underlying agreement had occurred in the sixth year, then that would have been fine because they would have, they would have been required or should have known they should have uh, renewed the judgment within the five original five years but at the the actual agreement which is found at record 43 exhibit b and i'm looking at paragraph four says uh, once the stipulated judgment has been signed and entered by the court plaintiff agrees not to record the judgment with the maricopa county recorder or to seek to enforce the judgment so we weren't even allowed under the negotiated settlement to record the judgment in the first place how does that how does that affect your ability to renew it is re, here's my ignorance it, it it is the renewal of a judgment something you must do in the county recorder's office yeah you 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 file the affidavit to, to you, you have to record it in the first place before you can renew it there's you know how can i have another until i had one type of a situation so here th this what this is clearly a situation where the good faith compromise negotiated by the parties is if, if we're going to rule the way council wants us to that that type of a negotiated settlement is not possible the only way that you can do it is if you're going to get the court involved and actually have the court issue a judgment that says here are the conditions under which you can you know you can enforce it only and and, and that kind of undercuts the whole public policy of favoring parties getting together and compromising and not having to drag everything into the court system. So the, the issue of, of renewals or not really is not our uh, table here. The, the, the issue of renewal is not really our issue here at all. Our issue here is enforceability, which to Judge Cruz's point is the distinction that, that the Supreme Court made very clear in the Smith case. While a a tolling of the statute of limitations in this statute um, affects enforceability. It does extend the period, as counsel concedes. It doesn't extend the five-year renewal period. That's something distinct. We're not arguing that we're timely in renewing. We're simply saying, as the trial court did, that the five years was renewed I'm sorry, was extended because of the tolling during the time period that we simply were not able to do anything other than wait. Um, and, and so, and that's no different. There is no, it is, counsel is correct that every case that, you know, that we've cited, that we're talking about, arise out of different scenarios. You know, there's either a, a court rule that says supersedious bonds, you know, are you, you are stay the action, stay the enforceability, or a court judgment, or some sort of a of an injunction order, something out there, that and that's different than a a private contract. But is it is it a meaningful difference? It's like saying, well, the first three cases that held the proposition that a dog owner is responsible for his dog biting somebody all involved German shepherds. And therefore, this is a, you know, a Doberman pincher. That doesn't make any sense. That's not a distinction without a difference. Here is the same thing. We are, just, let me address what the, what, what's the reasoning and the rationale that the cases have relied upon to get to the rule about tolling. 
And they all apply here. There's no, there's no meaningful difference. For example, in the Groves case, it says, but this does not mean that one must attempt to execute or sue on the judgment when one does not have the right to. Here we didn't have the right to. We agreed. We had a private law between us that we weren't going to, that we could not enforce it. We couldn't even record the judgment to begin with. Um, Groves again says, when an action on a judgment would not be entertained until after the lapse of a certain time or until the occurrence of a particular event, the statute does not begin to run until the accrual of a cause of action on the judgment. Again, that language, that principle being announced applies equally to our situation as any other uh, that has been been involved in the, the cases decided to date. Council acknowledges that Harding probably has the best explanation of the underlying rationale. I agree with him, but I disagree with Council's characterization of what that underlying rationale was. For that purpose, this court re re referred to a Minnesota decision and quoted um, that case as saying, the reason for this is that the stay of execution being with the consent of or for the benefit of the judgment debtor. Here, the whole, the, 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 it was with the consent of and for the benefit of the judgment debtor that we weren't going to record the judgment. He didn't have to worry about being, that being on the record and we weren't going to execute as long as he did his end of the deal. That's the underlying rationale. The court, the Minnesota court goes on. He should not take advantage he should not take advantage of them, nor could he be surprised or prejudiced by the delay because the delay was in fact referable to himself. That's the underlying rationale for this principle. That applies equally, fully, completely to this situation, just as much as it does to a supersedious bond or a judgment or an order. Our courts have repeatedly say that we, our public policy favors private settlements. We want to encourage parties to do that. This a decision overturning the what the trial court did here would violate that public policy. It would undermine parties' ability to reach a settlement. Again, we're not talking about renewal. That is a different situation. We're simply talking about a tolling like you do with any other statute of limitations. Council began by saying the question, the issue in this case is whether we're going to enforce this five-year period the way the legislature wrote it. Well, if we look at every other statute of limitations that the legislature wrote, they always say a claim must be brought within six years or two years or it's barred. That's what they say. But yet there are all kinds of principles. The discovery rule extends the, the statute of limitations in some cases. Well, that's not a court order or a judgment that affects that tolling. That's simply the facts of the case. This isn't going to wreak havoc among all the existing consent judgments or settlements that are out there. This is something that's already built into our system, already built into our law. The tolling is well established. And this, like, like Groves, this court said in Groves, the statute of limitations contained in section 12-1551, like all statutes of limitation, does not begin to run against the judgment if it is not suable. This wasn't suable. The, the tolling is appropriate and the enforcement time for our judgment does not expire, did not expire when we first were arguing this until November of 2019, but we believe now it's actually been extended another five years by the amendment to the statute um, for, for the, the deadline for enforcement. So unless there's other questions, I won't take up any more of the court's time and ask that the court uh, affirm the judgment below. We're good, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I'll briefly hit a couple of points because I only have one minute. But as to the new argument, which didn't appear in uh, the appellee's brief, about the distinction between recording a judgment and renewing a judgment, um, counsel just has the statement of the law wrong. 
uh, rule uh, statute 12-1612 is the renewal by affidavit statute. 1612A says a judgment for payment of money that has been uh, entered and docketed on the civil docket, um, etc., cetera, uh, may be renewed by filing an affidavit for renewal with the clerk of the proper court. So the notion that recording a judgment is a required prerequisite to renewing a judgment is wrong on the law. And um, the Section 1612F makes that absolutely clear because it says that recorded judgments that have been timely renewed by a renewal affidavit, i.e. an affidavit put on the docket, uh, may be renewed um, if, if prior renewal affidavits were filed within the 90 days. So rec recordation is not a prerequisite um, to, to renewal. And that's my time period. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thanks to the council for your argument and for your briefing. We'll take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. We're going to remain on the bench now to allow the council for the next case to come forward. Thank you.